So I'm a teacher. I teach kindergarten in Monona Grove School District. I've been teaching for about 13 years. Um, I love the littles and I think kindergarten teachers know a lot about how to help kids regulate their emotions. So I think that's why we're kind of passionate about what we do. Um, you can do the next slide, please. <laughs> Thank you. So what we'll be starting out talking about is what is normal. Um, you might be asking yourself what is normal, but there really, there is no normal right now. I mean, we're in a pandemic. You need to make your own normal as a family. So it's a really loaded question, but you might be asking yourself what kind of behaviors you're seeing at home and if they're normal or not. So ask yourself, have you seen over emotions? Have you seen your child be quiet or reserved or maybe exhausted? Um, have you noticed any irritability, hyperactivity, or having frequent meltdowns? That is normal behavior. That is even normal behavior when, when we're in regular school, um, in our classrooms, when they are adjusting to a routine, and, and this is all brand new to them, oftentimes they'll go home at the end of the day and have those meltdowns because it's just what they do at this age. So it is absolutely normal. Um, every year when any transition happens out of the ordinary behavior will occur when you're doing a new adjustment. So, but what I'd like to um, pinpoint today is that when your child is having a meltdown at the end of the school day, it's actually kind of a good sign. Kids work really hard all day um, to bottle up their emotions and you are their sense of safety to let it all out. And the best thing you can do for your child um, is to provide them with the tools and resources to get them into a good headspace. To help with this in the classroom, teachers often help the kids identify and acknowledge the feelings that they're having and help them understand that it's okay to have those feelings. So the number one resource to help those, your kids with that is you. You are their best resource. You are the one who gets to listen to them. You can listen to them with an open mind and ha with heart and empathy for their situation because this is really hard for kids. It's hard for everyone, but the kids don't necessarily have all the resources to help themselves. And that's where you and teachers come in. Um, you might be thinking about expectations as well. There are so many expectations right now. Um, teachers understand that because a lot of us are in the exact same boat. Um, a lot of us are battling work kids, school, bills, cleaning, laundry, feeding your children, yard work, the list goes on and on. When it comes to school expectations, communication with your child's teacher is so important. Teachers really want kids to be um, in a good mental health state. That is number one. So talking to your child's teacher about how to prioritize things, if you, if you are a family who's struggling to get all those things done is, is really key. Which activities or homework tasks are the most important to help your child grow? And which could be set, out, set off to the wayside to keep your sanity? Again, pri prioritizing and communicating with teachers. Teachers want to help. Um, I also wanna to touch on how to take clues from your child. One thing that we uh, really advocate for is movement breaks and just breaks built in throughout the day and having them be routine um, at a normal time in between certain classes. Um, we really strongly advocate outdoor physical activities, getting to a playground or a park or a backyard. Even in school when it's 10 degrees, we get the kids in their snow gear and we get them outside for 10 minutes. Even if it takes 10 minutes to get their stuff on and 10 minutes to get their stuff off, we feel that that 10 minutes that they're running and playing and getting out their energy really gets them in a better uh, space to go on with their day. Um, using uh, Also providing a high protein snack during this time, such as cheese or peanut butter crackers would be helpful. We like to use first then language as well. Um, for motivation and to provide them with positive rewards. So for example, you could say, first you finish this math activity and then you get to build with Legos. Um, this also, this of, often helps kids take control of their learning and feel like they're getting um, more of a say. 
Um, and even the smallest rewards can go a long way. We as teachers in our classroom usually have things like stickers or a little treasure box with little erasers or pencils and just little things like that could really go a long way. Um, and last, I'd like to talk about calming tools and calming spaces that can make your children feel more secure and in charge of their self-control um, and to reflect on their feelings and emotions. Um, so next slide, please. Here are some visuals um, to show you the ideas of calming spaces. So this is kind of a safe space that you would see in the top left corner um, in our classrooms maybe. We just find any kind of little corner or any little space, even if it's between two little um, filing cabinets for a spot for a student to go if they, they need to just get a break and get away and just breathe. Um, we actually all have them in our classrooms in my building and the kids use them quite a lot. So this is something you could make at home in a small corner of their bedroom. Um, you could put things in there that would help them focus such as maybe a, a stuffed animal, or I actually love these little, I don't know what they're called, but it's a fidget toy. It's just a marble inside of um, a little mesh thing. And anything, I mean, I'm holding it right now because I'm one of those people that needs <laughs> something to stay calm and I totally get it. Kids like to hold stuff. If there's anything like, um, a, like a time or a putty or anything that helps your child relax, and they can have it in their hands, I'm all for it. I think it's great. Some other things you could have in your safe space, some crayons and paper and pencils and some visuals of ways that they can get their body back to normal, such as this five finger breathing. Um, we teach the kids to breathe in as they go up their finger and go and breathe out as they go down and then breathe in and breathe out. And we also teach our kids to um, practice smelling a flower and blowing out the candle. And as they practice that, they're, they're breathing in and out and their body's getting back to a normal state. So those are my ideas for helping um, with calming down and um, expectations and also what's normal. And now I'd like to pass it on to Erin Gelhausen. Thank you, Jessica. So as she said, my name is Erin um, Gelhausen. I have been teaching for about 14 years, and um, this year I'm teaching in a school that is all virtual all the time, and I'm teaching grades 4K through second grade. And I also have two children of my own, one who is in kindergarten and one who is in second grade. So um, lots of virtual learning going on in my house these days. <laughs> so um, if, thank you for moving the slide ahead. So I'm going to talk tonight about how to prioritize assignments and some skill building um, resources. So one of the things that Jessica highlighted a little bit was about giving kids voice and choice. Um, it just um, makes them feel like they're in, more in control of what's going on and what they're doing. Um, so even asking them, well, what would you like to do first? You know, usually students have a lot of things to get done during the day, whether it's read books or do a certain app on their iPad, things like that. Some kids want to tackle the difficult task right away, while others want to save that till the end. So even just giving them that amount of freedom to decide what order their activities will be in um, can be helpful. Um, also, Jessica talked about prioritizing mental health. And so um, I just have a few resources listed here on the screen that I, I have used with students and my own children, um, because I find that if, I, if I'm noticing my students or my own children are getting stressed or the assignments are starting to feel too difficult, um, sometimes just taking that, that mental break is enough to get them to want to come back to it later. But also scheduling these kind of mental breaks throughout the day, as Jessica said, having it be a predictable part of their day can also make um, assignments and um, their tasks more manageable throughout the day when they aren't waiting until they're already um, out of regular, like they're dysregulated. They're not waiting until then to do these activities. They're, they're, they're making them a normal part of their day and routine. So Cosmic Kids is a lot of fun yoga adventures on YouTube and there also is something called the Zen Den, which focuses more on mindfulness and breathing um, versus the yoga. So they're two separate things um, led by the same instructor. 
And then Go Noodle is a website that kids often use when they're in the brick and mortar setting. Um, and I use it virtually as well. And there, there's a flow channel on there, it's called, which helps kids relax and think positive thoughts, um, do some mindfulness exercises. But there's also great resources on there too for the more energizing breaks. If they're needing to get some wiggles out, there's, there are tons of videos on that website. Next slide, please. Okay, so the next thing um, was that it's important to remember to reach out to your child's teacher if you're finding that the workload isn't manageable um, or if you're having other concerns regarding their assignments or just work in general. Um, I know as a teacher, I often want to provide as much as I can for families as most teachers do. And it's not meant to overwhelm, but more to offer as much support as we can and resources. I mean, we have sort all sorts of things in our toolkits that we want to share, um, but I know that can also be overwhelming to families if they're not sure which ones to prioritize. Um, so just be honest with your child's teacher and let them know if, um, if what they're sending is too much or maybe just to highlight what are the most important things that need to get done so that the kids aren't getting overwhelmed with their work. Another suggestion, suggestion that we have um, is that if the assigned work isn't in a format that works for your child, to, to figure out what works best for them. Some kids do, do better when they're completing an assignment uh, with paper and pencil. Um, others like to record videos on the iPad and, and verbally explain to the teacher what they know. Um, another thing that my daughter has done this year through the help of her library media specialist is she suggest suggested to families that they turn on the enable dictation feature on the iPad so that children can 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 um, turn the, their, their speech into text. And it's one thing she uses it for is even to search for library books in the digital card or like the library, the, the catalog. Um, and so that visual there on the screen shows that if you go into settings um, under general, you can tap on the word keyboard and then enable dictation will pop up. And if it's highlighted green, like you see on the screen there, then that means that it is enabled and your child will be able to talk to the iPad um, and have it type what, it, what the child is saying. So that's just a tip that maybe some families didn't know that could help your child as they're working through their assignments. Next slide, please. Um, another thing that's important to know is that that it is okay for for your kids to struggle when they are doing their work, and I know that's hard, especially with our youngest learners, to see them get frustrated um, and and run into that um, those those frustrations and roadblocks. And typically, when kids are in the brick and mortar setting the parents aren't there to see that happen on such an immediate basis. Um, but now that kids are home and parents are watching their, their own children learn new concepts and try out new things, um, there is, you will notice more frustration and it's okay to let them have that productive struggle. And it's most important to just give them reassurance and support and remind them that mistakes are okay and it's what helps our brains grow and giving them that um, those affirmations and positive reinforcement is, is so much more powerful than just giving them the answers um, or telling them how to do it. Like having them come up with their own strategies and, and, so, and problem solving ways is very powerful. And so I just included some visuals for families, um, some, some phrases that I often say in my classroom about how your brain is like a muscle and, the mistakes are what help it grow. And if we don't do challenging things, then our brain will never get stronger. So those mistakes are important. And um, in my classroom, I often have these types of phrases posted on the walls and um, you can find things on Pinterest and all over the internet that have these phrases, you could write them on a piece of paper and, and hang them up in your child's room or wherever their workspace is just to remind them um, that they are smart and brave and courageous people and that they can do hard things. So that's what I have today. And um, Renee, you can take it away. Thank you, Erin. So I 
I'm going to ironically talk about how to balance parenting work and online learning. And I say ironic because I'm coming off of a day where I had all three of my children home doing online learning and I have a 4 k -er, a fourth grader and a fifth grader. So I'm no expert in this area, but I'm going through it too. Um, first and foremost, what what is essential for support and success for you as a parent, but also for your child is to get organized. Um, you have an organized workspace for you to do your job. Your child equally needs an organized workspace. It doesn't have to be a separate desk. As you can see in the picture on the slide, it can be a, a tag board that you can put away at the end of the day if you need that space for your living. Um, something that is theirs, however, in that space, it's helpful for them to have their schedule and or a to-do list, a visual for them to see what, what am I doing today? What am I needing to do today? If they were in school, we would have a schedule of our day up for them to see there. You probably have a similar schedule for your work. So it's, it, what's helpful for you is also helpful for your learner. Um, also in that workspace, have the materials that they need for the day. Um, with my daughter, especially in 4K, we look at what she needs, we put it all in a pile. So I'm not sitting there next to her. All she has to do is look in that pile because she knows that mom has put it there for her. Um, having everything that they need at their fingertips. You can see the little caddy there with crayons, markers, colored pencils, scissors, anything that they might possibly need. Just like at school, it's all right there for them. They don't have to go looking for it. It saves time, it saves their, their angst and anxiety, and it makes things run smoother. But also part of this getting organized is involve your learner, involve your child into it. They probably see you setting up your workspace and you having your stuff the way that you want it. Let them be a part of that too. They, they may be young, but they know in some respects what works for them or how they want it. Um, also part of the getting organized and having a workspace is having a comfortable way to learn. And this doesn't mean it's a one size fits all and that's where they need to be all day. If they were in the building, um, we move around a lot, especially the littles, uh, but even into fifth grade, there are so many different places to sit, different positions to sit in, different things to sit on. Um, it, like Jessica said, your child needs to move. And part of that might be while they're working, um, sitting on their knees, standing to do their job, sitting crisscross applesauce, laying down to the outside person. It may look like, wow, how are you, how are you even paying attention? But to your child, that's a way of them getting out their wiggles and being comfortable. And like, we can't learn and do things when we're not comfortable. Your child is the same way. Next. Another thing that might work for you as an adult trying to work from home is to have some sort of visual cueing system for your child to see when is a good time to interrupt you or come in and talk to you, and maybe when it's not a good time to come and talk to you. A quick Google search, I found a few of these. You can even make your own. I know Erin had made one for her kids. Um, show it to them, talk to them about it, tell them what it means. Um, but then also to go along with that, give your child some ideas of what can they do if you're not available. The picture on the right is just, again, a quick Google search of some ideas. Um, your, your lists or your writing should have pictures accompanying it, especially for those littles. Um, but give them some, some ideas of what to do. P take out a book, draw, color. Um, maybe something like a movement break, but give them some ideas of what they can do if you're not available to help them. Um, make sure I don't forget anything. Um, also, like Jessica said, um, have some, some fidget things available, things for them to hold in their hands, go, to go along. Their, their body may not need to move, but their hands might need to move. Chewing gum. Um, teachers allow kids to chew gum in school. Sometimes it's what a kid needs. It takes their brain off of other things and allows them to put that, that brain power onto their learning. Next. Um, and lastly, um, some, some 
ideas that might help are use your, your child's teacher and allow your child to use their teacher. Erin mentioned it and Jessica mentioned it. If we were in the building with our students, there's only one of us and a whole class. We can't stop and answer for them and, and walk them through every single task one-on-one. -on -one. They have to learn to be independent. And that's one of the, the luxuries of being in school that your child learns the independence that they may not be allowed to learn at home just because of the nature that there's more adults there. Uh, but, but use that to your advantage in this situation. If your child did an activity and it potentially wasn't right and you know it wasn't right, it's okay for them to turn it in that way. That's our job as teachers. We look at those, we send them back, we give them feedback, just like we would do if we were in the building. We, we are willing and able to do that. And, and that's how we feel connected with your child right now too. Um, and then lastly, some time-saving ideas that sometimes are, are not easy to think about. Um, some of the things that your child might need to do during the day can be done in, in non-traditional parts of your day. For example, a car ride. If you have to, to go somewhere on a daily basis, go pick up your groceries, let them do their reading then. Um, sitting at the lunch table, eating their lunch. Maybe they can listen to a story or maybe there's a, a part of a lesson that they need to watch. Let them listen to it and do it at that point. Use older siblings. They're, they're, that's just as beneficial for your older child as it is for your younger child to, to reach out and help them. They're both getting something from that situation. And then also lastly, um, daycare. If your child goes to daycare, they, they can just as easily do the work there. They don't necessarily have to do it with you. That teachers are, are used to that. Um, we're, we're willing to work with the daycare provider and again, offer feedback if, if necessary based on what your child has turned in.